Hello and welcome to the 15th episode of the European Conservatives podcast, Brussels and Beyond, a podcast designed to keep you in the loop about the political wheelings and dealings that are happening here in Brussels and in the capitals of Europe. My name is Zoltan Kotas. French right-wing populist leader Marine Le Pen has proposed a merger between the two sovereignist conservative blocs in the European Parliament, arguing that a united right could be the second largest group in Brussels. The parties have usually dismissed the idea of merging the European Conservatives and Reformists and the Identity and Democracy groups before, but the option was put back on the table after the expulsion of the German AFD party from the Identity and Democracy group last week. The group voted to exclude AFD following statements made by the party's top candidate, seemingly relativizing the actions of SS soldiers during World War II. This is the moment to unite. It would be truly useful, Marine Le Pen said, directing her message to Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni, the de facto leader of the European Conservatives and Reformists group. Both Le Pen's national rally and Meloni's Brothers of Italy are on track to become the largest delegations of their respective groups after the European elections. The main political difference between the groups is the subject of Ukraine. The Conservatives favour the mainstream EU position of financing and arming Ukraine for as long as it takes, while most identity and democracy members place national interests first and advocate for diplomatic solutions instead. The Italian Prime Minister did not rule out accepting the offer but she did not pledge anything concrete either. Meloni may be considering closer cooperation with the centre-right European People's Party, which is set to keep its position as the largest bloc in the parliament. Meanwhile, the German AFD party could be looking to create a whole new political grouping of its own. Any new formation would have to include at least 23 MEPs, representing at least seven member states. With AFD easily contributing 16 to 17 seats alone, the project does have a chance of becoming a reality. Kostadin Kostadinov, leader of the Bulgarian right-wing populist party Revival, has extended an offer to team up with the Germans, saying there is an opportunity to create a real conservative and sovereignist group in the European Parliament. Other parties that could be taken into account are the Hungarian Our Homeland Movement, the Polish Confederacja and the Dutch Forum for Democracy. EU taxpayers' money is being spent to boost the chances of mainstream parties in June's European elections, according to Charlie Weimers, lead candidate of the National Conservative Sweden Democrats Party. Tens of millions of euros have been dispersed by Brussels toward an ongoing campaign that's officially designed to persuade more people to vote in the EU elections, as well as to raise awareness about the benefits of the European Union. The goal is to influence election results in a direction favourable to the bureaucracy with citizens' tax money, according to Charlie Weimers, who believes that taxpayers' money is going towards advertising that targets pro-EU voters and towards mainstream media that portray the EU in a positive light. The plan is simple, focus on all the good things the EU does, which in turn will discourage people from supporting EU critical parties and politicians. This communication strategy was approved by every parliamentary group in Brussels, except the two right-wing populist blocs. Hungarian Foreign Minister Peter Szijjártó said he had been harshly criticised by his colleagues from other countries at the EU Affairs Ministers' meeting in Brussels on Monday. Hungary refused for the EU to give 6.5 billion euros worth of arms deliveries to Ukraine. Hungary has vetoed a number of EU decisions involving Ukraine and has been the only EU member state since the outset of the war to reject sending weapons. My German, Polish and Lithuanian colleagues all attacked me, but they can shout as much as they like, we are not going to give in to pro-war pressure. We want to avoid the escalation of the war, Siarto said after the meeting. He said plans by EU and NATO member states to play a more active role on the ground in Ukraine threatened to escalate the situation and drag the rest of Europe into an all-out war with Russia. Some NATO member countries, especially the Baltic states, Britain and Canada, are urging the alliance to move some NATO operations to within Ukrainian territory. 
Both the United States and Germany announced this week that they would allow weapons they supply to Ukraine to be used against targets inside Russian territory. The two NATO member states have emphasized that their decision applies only to targets inside Russia near the border with the northeastern Ukrainian Kharkiv region, where Moscow launched an offensive a few weeks ago. The Ukrainian army is facing a slow Russian advance on the battlefield and is finding it difficult to replenish its forces. Ukraine's top commander, Oleksandr Dysirsky, said on Monday he had signed paperwork allowing French military instructors to visit Ukrainian training centers soon. The plans come on the heels of French President Emmanuel Macron's controversial and divisive comments, saying that sending Western troops to Ukraine should not be ruled out. Poland is building a massive defense infrastructure on its eastern border with Belarus and Russia. The plans were unveiled on Tuesday by the Defense Ministry. The aim is to create a defensive wall to render any surprise invasion from Russia impossible. The project will include physical infrastructure, such as bunkers, anti-tank obstacles and even minefields, as well as electronic elements like satellite monitoring, anti-drone systems and thermal imaging cameras. Construction will begin this summer and is planned to be completed by 2028. Warsaw will try to secure financial help from Brussels to help the construction as soon as possible. Poland will coordinate the project with the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, which have also begun fortifying their borders with Russia. Poland plans to quit the Ottawa Convention, which prohibits the use of anti-personnel landmines so it can set up extensive minefields along its eastern borders. However, Defence Minister Vladislav Kosniak-Kamish said that arming them will only take place when we are sure that war is inevitable. Farmers are once again descending on Brussels. The Dutch Farmers' Defence Force is organising a demonstration in the Belgian capital on Monday to defend their industry and way of life. My colleague Thomas O'Reilly is here to explain. Thomas, what can you tell us about the demonstration? Well, this demonstration planned for June 4th is basically seen as a last push by a pan-European collection of farmers' groups to sway Eurocrats right in the heart of the EU capital ahead of next week's European elections. The demonstrations are being spearheaded by the Dutch, specifically the Farmers' Defence Force. And so far we have confirmation from Spanish, French, Belgian, German and even Polish groups of their attendance. Uh, there's been many similar demonstrations in the centre of Brussels the past year. Uh, I can think of three since uh, this side of Christmas. Uh, farmers su successfully shut down the European capital on all these occasions. Uh, they were running battles with police, the use of CS gas, as well as burning hay right outside the Commission headquarters in Berlamont. But the ostensible reason uh, for these demonstrations is to put sand in the gears of the European Green Deal uh, right at the, the cusp of the European elections. Um, this demonstration, uh, we've seen uh, estimates of five to 10,000 farmers potentially in, uh, in Brussels next week, but we've seen murmurings of this uh, the past few months in certain sort of farming activist circles, but uh, this initiative is being led by the Dutch in particular. As you mentioned, farmers all around Europe have been protesting harmful green policies for many, many months. Uh, we saw them here in Brussels as well. They were blocking the streets. Uh, have these protests achieved anything? Well, these protests have seen reasonable gains, uh, certainly in the Netherlands, the epicenter for this protest wave. Uh, they were able to famously stall the rollout of the nitrate uh, rules which far many farmers say restricts their businesses and even imposes mandatory purchase orders on many smaller farms. Uh, that being said, despite the recent gains by the Farmers Party at a local level, uh, the, Bel the Dutch government still wants to presume uh, some element of uh, nitrate limits, even under the new coalition. In France, uh, protests earlier this year they led to the derailing of essentially the free trade agreement between the EU and Latin America. Um, this, in the eyes of farmers, would have imposed cheap imports on their industry. And famously, in Eastern Europe, 
uh, direct action by farmers in Poland and Hungary, uh, or even in the Baltics, um, led to the restrictions on the flow of Ukrainian grain uh, through their countries, which they believe uh, had uh, hampered their profit margins by leading to a major overflow. Yeah, these demonstrations, they may not have entirely uh, decapitated the European Green Deal, but they have gained major gains at a national level and look like setting the tone of the bait among the sort of uh, traditional catch-all parties where farmers used to uh, cast their vote. But um, yes, this is, uh, this is the last chance that's going to sway the hand of voters and Eurocrats before elections. And is it possible that the farmers, this protest, the Green Deal and all these issues could have an impact on the outcome of the European elections? Well, this process itself um, will merely just add to a growing current of discontent among farmers. Uh, we've seen uh, particular traditional centre and centre-right parties aligned to the European People's Party uh, see major hits. Um, we've seen many sort of scare pieces about the rise of so-called farmer extremism and how that feeds into uh, right-wing populism. What I find is rather interesting is the group that is leading next week's protests in, in Brussels, the Farmers' Defence League, they originated not just in opposition to, to new nitrate rules, but and on very militant animal rights groups. Uh, they garnered a name for themselves for their popular resistance to the European Green New Deal. Uh, including blockades and uh, and uh, such actions like we're going to see next week. But definitely the, these uh, protests have been uh, uh, coming hot and heavy uh, across Europe. Uh, they've achieved gains and it, um, they, they have made parts of the European Green New Deal certainly unviable uh, heading into the next legislative term. Thomas, thank you very much. Georgia is set to pass its so-called foreign interference law in the next couple of days, a law that has caused tension domestically and upset the European Union and the United States. According to the new law, NGOs and media outlets receiving more than 20% of their funding from abroad would have to register as pursuing the interests of a foreign power and provide more detailed reports on their finance and activities with fines for those who do not obey. The bill has been criticized by the opposition for resembling a similar Russian law that allows the Kremlin to crack down on critical news media, non-profits and activists. However, the ruling party, Georgian Dream, said they modeled their law on the United States Foreign Agents Registration Act and pointed to the fact that many similar laws exist in the Western world. France only recently adopted the bill to counter foreign interference including making it compulsory for lobbyists who act on behalf of foreign governments, state-controlled companies and political parties to sign up to registry. Meanwhile, the European Commission adopted its so-called Defense of Democracy package last year, which would oblige groups working for non-EU foreign countries to register in a transparency register and publicly state how much they receive, which countries they are supported by and what their main goals are. But it is the Georgian bill and a similar Hungarian law that is attracting the attention of the mainstream media and the liberal elites. No wonder. Georgia has gone down a path that irritates both the EU and Washington. It is pursuing pragmatic relations with Russia. It has not imposed sanctions on Russia after its invasion of Ukraine. Georgia's ruling party also recently initiated a draft of constitutional amendment that prohibit the legislation of same-sex civil partnership the adoption of children by same-sex couples and gender reassignment. The Prime Minister, Irakli Kobakidze, has also spoken out against illegal immigration and vowed to protect Christian values. Dick Schorf will become the new Prime Minister of the Netherlands after an agreement by the centre-right and right-wing parties that are forming a coalition. Gert Wilders, whose anti-immigration party for freedom won November's elections, said Dick Schorf has a great track record, he has integrity, and he is non-partisan, therefore is above party politics. The 67-year-old Schorf is currently the Secretary General of the Ministry of Justice. He previously led the Dutch Intelligence Service. He said he wanted to be Prime Minister of all Dutch people and said he would implement the plans agreed on by the incoming Conservative coalition government. 
However, the choice of Prime Minister has raised serious concerns among the Dutch right. Thierry Baudet, leader of the opposition anti-globalist Forum for Democracy, accused Schorff of being responsible for the ever greater curtailment of civil liberties. He cited Schorff's efforts to increase Dutch intelligence's surveillance powers and accused him for spying on the citizens of the country. Right-wing commentator Eva Vlaardingenbroek described Schorff as the personification of a technocratic bureaucrat and, being a former member of the Dutch Labour Party, the exact opposite of what the Dutch population has voted for during the elections last November. Gender ideology has become embedded within the Scottish school system, according to a newly released report by the campaign group for Women Scotland. The findings are based on freedom of information requests from hundreds of secondary schools attended by children aged 11 upwards. According to these statistics, at least 95% of Scottish secondary schools are telling children they can self-identify their gender, compared to 40% of English schools. 89% of Scottish schools teach children that people have a gender identity that may be different from their sex. 37% teach that a person who self-identifies as a man or a woman should be treated as such in all circumstances, even if this does not match their biological sex. And just 4% of Scottish parents can expect to be informed if their child expresses distress about gender at school. The campaign group blames the Scottish government's transgender guidance, which the majority of schools unquestioningly follow. Germany has broken records for the number of foreigners being given citizenship, with official statistics reporting more than 200,000 naturalizations in 2023 alone. The German Federal Statistics Office reported a jump of more than 40% in naturalizations since 2021, with 75,000 Syrians alone receiving a German passport and the right to vote just last year. Under a new law, 5.3 million immigrants who have been resident in Germany for the past 10 years could be eligible to receive citizenship. Future applicants could be required to be residents of Germany for a mere five years before receiving citizenship. The opposition centre-right Christian Democratic Union, which, under the leadership of Chancellor Angela Merkel, oversaw an open border policy and allowed hundreds of thousands of mostly Syrian migrants sent to Germany, are now saying they would undo the measures of the current left-wing government if they were to be re-elected to power. Right-wing AFD party leader Alice Weidel opposed the naturalization plans, saying the country risked the import of foreign conflicts and the influence of foreign powers on growing parts of the German population. And finally, we have a fascinating and insightful interview with Fabrice Leggeri, the former chief of the European Union's border and coast guard agency Frontex, who is now running for a seat in the European Parliament for Marine Le Pen's party, the National Rally. Fabrice Leggeri explains that he was forced out of his job as the head of Frontex because it quickly became clear to him that there was a huge political difference between him and the European Commission, led by Ursula von der Leyen. He said, and I quote, My concept of the mission was to establish a law enforcement authority to help nation-state authorities protect their borders, not to be an NGO or a humanitarian agency. When he told Ilva Johansson, the EU's Home Affairs Commissioner, that Frontex was preparing to equip itself with small arms and uniforms, she said, You don't need guns and uniforms because migrants come in search of love. Europe is an aging continent. So whether you like it or not, it is your job to welcome migrants. In the interview, Fabrice Leggeri says NGOs and the mainstream media provided false reporting about the situation at the Greek-Turkish border and falsely accused Frontex of pushing back migrants. In fact, if you look closely at the situation, the scenario was provided by George Soros's Open Society. From that moment on, I was under continuous media and political attack until I resigned, he says. He also talked about how fundamental rights monitors, NGOs and Ilva Johansson herself had complicated matters at the borders of Poland and Lithuania who had been protecting themselves from an influx of illegal migrants from the direction of Belarus. As Fabrice Leggeri says, and I quote, There are people in NGOs who honestly want to help, 
naive idealists who do not realize that they are helping criminal activities. Others simply hate the West and want to fill Europe with people from all over the world. And then there are what we in France call Islamo-leftists who want to bring large masses of Muslim population into Europe. It is a mystery why so many members of these NGOs who are Europeans hate European civilization so much. I cannot understand it. Under Fabrice Lagerie's leadership, Frontex found evidence that there is coordination between some NGOs and the people smugglers. These NGOs would announce where and when they would be in a certain place, and this information was shared with the smugglers. On why he is entering politics, Fabrice Lagerie said, and I quote, because I have witnessed what the Commission has done with Johansson and with von der Leyen, if I went back to my old civil service post, it was clear to me that I would have to remain silent and obey. On the other hand, if I wanted to fight to strengthen our borders, to open the eyes of the citizens and also of our governments, I had to go into politics. To find out how he would fix the migration problem, read the full interview on our website, europeanconservative.com. And that concludes this episode of Brussels and Beyond. Don't forget to read our magazine, check out our website, subscribe to our Twitter, Facebook and YouTube channels and watch our monthly TV show Inside Brussels. Hope you tune in again next week. Have a very good week. Bye bye.